Um, I mentioned last time that the historians today, they most of them paint the picture that the party played a big role in the struggle for, against racism for school equality in the 20s and 30s. And but come the uh, period of McCarthyism in the late 40s, uh, the party was no longer a factor in the struggle against uh, racism and for full equality. Uh, there is now a new school of historians. A couple of them have interviewed me because uh, I was involved in the work of the party nationally in, in this period, uh, who contend that that's not true that the party was smaller but and it had to work in different ways that uh, Jarvis was referring to, uh, not uh, bragging about or showing the red flag everywhere, but we were a, a, a significant factor in the whole, what we now call the Civil Rights Revolution, in which uh, Jarvis just also called it a revolution, and I know the leadership of the party Shortly after the spontaneous movement, which spread rapidly all over the South, of uh, students sitting in at Woolworths and, uh, and other places where they, they would not serve African American people. Uh, <clears throat> this movement that was sweeping the South on that score and on the score of fighting for the right to register to vote and every other sign of Jim Crow. Uh, in the South was being attacked. It was spreading rapidly. So the party leadership concluded that this was a new third stage in the democratic revolution of the United States. The first stage being the American Revolution, the second stage being the Civil War, and this Civil Rights Revolution being the, the third stage, which was expanding democracy in the first place for the especially oppressed African-American people of the South and of the whole country, but for all Americans, that it was in the interest of all the people of the United States, all working people, at least. So we considered it very, very important, and we undertook to do things. Uh, b before I talk about some of the things that we did, um, you, you need to know a couple more things, I think, about the the period beforehand and what we were doing. Um, Jarvis mentioned uh, Jim Jackson and uh, held up his book and uh, mentioned the Southern Negro Youth Congress. The Southern Negro Youth Congress was formed in 1936-37 and lasted until about 1947. It was founded by six African-American, three couples, uh, six people, uh, <clears throat> who were members of the Young Communist League and with the support of the Communist Party, set up headquarters in Birmingham and uh, began years of activity that involved, the estimate is, 100,000 African-American youth and some white youth. In, in all these kind of activities that were aimed at registering to vote, fighting for the vote, fighting to organize unions. Uh, Jarvis mentioned uh, Jim Jackson and the organized organization of the 5,000 tobacco workers in uh, the Richmond area. Um, and in the course of this, he met many of the people who then became leaders of the movement uh, in the late 50s and into the 60s, into the Civil Rights Revolution. So that when that period came, uh, Jim Jackson, who then was the uh, Southern Party Secretary of the party, he headed the party's work in the South. And he, he traveled all over uh, every day at risk of his life. And uh, he knew some of the figures like uh, uh, C.T. Vivian, Th these were all ministers in, in the Southern Negro, in the so Southern Christian Leadership Conference organization that Martin Luther King uh, came to head. Uh, Lowry, uh, Wyatt T. Walker, 
Um, Shuttlesworth of Birmingham fame, and so on. And and he knew Rosa Parks from those days. She was part of the Southern Negro Youth Co uh, Congress. So was Sally Davis, the mother of Angela Davis, uh, a very active person in, in that movement. Uh, I'm tempted to tell some side stories, but time won't allow me. <clears throat> so, so come the Civil Rights Revolution proper, um, we were able to travel through the South and talk with people and find out what their needs were, how to help. And I'll tell you, I will tell you some concrete stories of, of that in a moment. And another aspect uh, of that uh, revolution, as uh, Jarvis again pointed out, was the uh, uh, peaceful protest, civil disobedience. Where did they learn that? Well, they learned it from Gandhi, that's true. But they also learned it at the Highlander Folk School in, in Chattanooga, Tennessee. What was the Highlander School Folk school, uh, school in Chattanooga? It was a center for opposition in the South to racism and for equality. And it was begun in 1933 by Miles Horton, a left-wing socialist, and Don West, a Methodist minister who died a few years ago at the age of 95, still uh, head of this school, who was a member of the Communist Party all that time, from 1933 to when he died, who went to the Highlander School. Many of the leaders of the Civil Rights Movement learned their uh, uh, tactics of peaceful resistance at the Highlander School. Uh, Coretta Scott King spent time there. John Lewis spent a lot of time there. And, and many others. So these were forms in which the party made a contribution. It set up a network of different kinds of organization, both in the South and throughout the country. Not alone, always with others but very effective. The, the history of the uh, organization of African American workers that begins in 1925 with the American Negro Labor uh, Council reestablished that. In, af after the Second World War, the, the National <coughs> Negro Labor Council was established with Coleman Young as the head of it the national head of it. Who was Coleman Young? Well, we know him as the six-term mayor of Detroit, Michigan. But Coleman Young was a worker in Ford River Rouge and uh, an active leader of the workers there and a member of the Communist Party. He was a member of the Communist Party and, and until he was uh, until he dropped out, being sworn in as mayor of, of Detroit. I, I met him in, in Detroit for the first time in 1960. These are things that are not known, and I think it's about time that uh, we, we don't have to worry so much about the anti-communist uh, smears. <clears throat> and that was part of what we did. We also established a, an organization that was aimed at white uh, anti-racist uh, people in the South. And that was the so Southern Conference Educational Fund, headed by Ann and Carl Braden. They were members of the party in 1946, I think it was. Their home in Louisville, Kentucky was bombed. And lo and behold, they arrested Carl Braden for bombing his own house and charged him with sedition. And he spent years in jail. Uh, and and Braden uh, dropped out of the party at some point. And uh, it, at their 21st Congress con convention of the party, uh, from the platform, she rejoined the party. So. 
Then we come to the events that uh, Jarvis mentioned in the period between the um, <clears throat> Brown versus Board of Education decision and the start of the sit-ins. And he mentioned that there was a prayer pilgrimage and there were two youth marches for integrated schools. The second, second one that went to Washington, D.C., uh, had 30,000 young people, mainly African-American, but quite a few white youth as well. We played a big role in the whole thing. Uh, ben Davis, one of our most prominent and magnificent African-American leaders of a party, of which we had many, um, he was, I don't know whether everybody here knows who he was, but he was uh, from Georgia. He defended Angelo Herndon in, in the early 30s, who was uh, a YCL organizer, uh, African-American, and was framed up and was facing um, 30 years in prison, and he won. He came to New York, and he became uh, a member of the city council on, on the Communist Party basis. He was, you know, uh, acknowledged as a leader of the Communist Party, and, and he, along with Pete Caccioni, uh, uh, won city council seats. Well, Ben Davis was also a friend of Bayard Rustin. I don't know whether you all, you know, remember the name Bayard Rustin. He, he appeared in, in a number of different periods. And one of them was he was the main organizer of the prayer pilgrimage and the, the two youth marches. And he did that after meeting with Ben Davis and being convinced that you needed a mass movement to enforce the Brown versus Board of Education. And I don't have time, I won't take the time now, about what we did in Philadelphia. Because of the, the 30,000 young people who went there, we brought 2,000 of them from Philadelphia. And, and that can be demonstrated. <clears throat> uh, so. These are then uh, Jarvis also mentioned uh, Little Rock, Arkansas, and that reminds me of the fact that I picked up the New York Times a couple months ago and I read the name Lee Lorch, an obituary for Lee Lorch. Who was Lee Lorch? He was a mathematics teacher, a member of the Communist Party, as was his wife Clara Lorch, and they lived in Stuyvesant Town which was a Jim Crow, all-white city within the city. And they led the fight for years, including bringing African-Americans in to stay for uh, months and months in their apartment. <clears throat> and then when they were uh, finally forced out, uh, they went to different places. He had a very hard time finding a job. They landed in Little Rock, Arkansas, with him as a professor at an, an all-black college there, and he became active in the NAACP, worked with Daisy Bates, worked with the, the first uh, effort of children, of African-American children, to enter a, a, a all-white school that was met, as Jarvis uh, pointed out, by vicious, vicious attacks on the children and spitting and throwing things and cursing them by a, a rather large white mob. And emerging, I didn't know this until I reread uh, Jim Jackson's book. He was there at that time. I, I had forgotten that. And he knew Daisy Bates from the Southern Negro Youth Congress. <clears throat> and he considered her a comrade. And uh, who stepped forward in, in that? rabble of people to put her arms around the African-American children and, and help take them into the school. Clara Lorch. So anyway, those are some of the, uh, the background hidden uh, things prior to uh, February 1st, 1960.